All right, so, so far we've seen fire control with insects, yeast, and, you know, we, we've seen the insect diseases and, and pests and uh, foliar pathogens. Now I'm going to focus on soil-borne pathogens. Um, so deploying microbes as a seed treatment for protection against uh, soil-borne plant pathogens. And um, a lot of this work um, is, is still ongoing. Uh, most of it's still ongoing, uh, but it came about about 10 years ago when I first began an exploration into biologically based uh, disease suppression. So using compost, manures, green manures, what have you, um, with the focus of soil-borne plant pathogens. And so I spent a considerable amount of time digging through the literature, just trying to get a, um, a, you know, a very clear understanding of, of where we are in that realm uh, and what we know and is anybody a uh, anybody so do work with soil borne plant pathogens all right well i apologize if i oversimplify this <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be great for everybody else um so conceptually thinking about it um in the soil um so you have your plant growing and you have these microbes soil-borne microbes uh, that uh, are just have no association or are very loosely associated with the plant. And they're just there doing their job, whatever that might be. Then you have others that are closely associated and almost that they're attracted to the plant. Um, some would call it communication. Um, and they're feeding off the seed exudates. And they could be um, very specific to the plants um, and parts of the, the root. And then lastly, you have your plant pathogen, and um, my research focus has always been on the oomycetes, Pythium um, also called a water mold. Um, so what we know, all right, is um, just a few generalities. Uh, we've identified, uh, or, or it, it, in the literature, you will say that uh, there's theories of suppression, how it occurs. Um, there's antibiosis, of toxins. These microbes here are producing toxins, which might lyse that. And I'll show a picture of that later. The, uh, there's nutrient competition. Again, if you have all these microbes here, they could be degrading the, um, the um, seed exudates that would um, kind of hide the plant from the, from the uh, pathogen, because um, the pathogen is attracted to those same exudates. Um, uh, it's a nutrient competition, antibiosis, um, systemic induced resistance, um, which can apply here. Um, it's a lot more difficult to tease that one out. And predation. So you'll have something like uh, trichoderma, I believe, uh, or there's other microbes that directly uh, feed on some of the plant pathogens. And so understanding this, they, a lot of people have focused on the material that like they uh, be it compost um, and they said all right why is this one suppressive and this one isn't and they've tried to look at the chemical profiles the nutrient uh, the um, biological profiles and you know they they say all right well there's these microbes in this one and these aren't present in this one so that's why but that really doesn't hold true throughout the literature and you can't predict it so you know we've looked at you know which microbes, how they work, and why suppression varies largely to come up empty-handed. We still don't really have a good idea. Um, so my first stuff was impacts of compost amendments on Pythium and Phanermatum and its pathogenic development. Let me just back up one more. Uh, so again, people were looking at um, the material and asking, uh, focusing all their attention on there. I took a change, uh, a different direction and said, all right, well, what's the pathogen doing in response to um, these organic amendments? So that's what I was focusing on. Um, and when you're doing that with the noomycete, it's extremely difficult um, compared to, uh, well, it's difficult in every, everybody's going to say that theirs is the most difficult, but they're difficult to culture, okay? They have a, a very, um, I think it's complicated, uh, life cycle more than maybe just bacteria um, where they much like a frog has different developmental stages this is the same way 
and um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but most of the research has been focused on these swimming zoospores. Okay, so all the oomycetes have a, uh, a zo zoospore stage, uh, and particularly all the pythiums. And so it's, it was always believed that the zoospore was the primary mode of infection as well. Um, now we're starting to think that maybe that's not that true. All right, so, and I'll show you some time-lapse videos of this, which is really cool because, you know, the swimming zoospore stage has got to be the coolest stage of all. You know, seeing these other ones just sitting there on a culture plate, it's not that great, but when you see one of these hatch and they explode out, you know, they're really great. Um, so a lot of research was done here and um, in our lab alone as well as elsewhere and we found some great information okay so there are toxins that can lyse these um, there is nutrient competition that uh, can prevent infection here all right and um, you know there you could use biocontrol agents uh, I think Orwinio was one of them um, that no Enterobacter was uh, was was what I'm thinking of but um, they could outcompete uh, that nutrient source, those exudates, and mask the the plant so that the swimming zoospore, which swims chemotactically towards the plant, um, can no longer detect the plant. So we were using a compost material, particularly vermicompost, and over several years we found that it was consistently suppressive when challenged in these uh, bioassays with pythium. So inoculated, non-inoculated, and we're just growing it in plain sand, sterile sand, and um, what this one is showing here is when you sterilize the um, vermicompost, you have disease. So um, it's microbially induced suppression. Okay, so non-sterile are these right here. So non-inoculated, no disease, of course, um, but no disease when the material is not sterile. So we know it's microbes are, are playing a role. Uh, we also do know that uh, unprotected seed, when there's no microbes there, um, it's making this uh, chemotactic swim just like a shark does towards blood. You know, just do the zigzagging, and finally it could reach a seed and cause infection. But um, the seed exudate and this gradient that comes out from the seed is altered, and the pathogen can no longer detect the seed. And that was some previous research. Um, by Allison Jack. Uh, all right, so we know what's going on here. We have a decent idea, uh, but the rest of this pathogen, um, we have no idea. Okay, so I was asking questions. Well, what happens upstage or um, up up river from from uh, swimming zoospores? Because suppression can uh, act on any one of these or potentially. So I said, well, what happens before the zoospores are released? Um, so particularly the sporangium, okay, and um, when challenged with vermicompost, um, does the development change? All right, so here's normal, uh, or quote, normal um, germination or development of the pathogen. You have the sporangium, the vesicles that form, and the, it's flooded conditions. They, they require flooded conditions um, to do this, and then the zoospores swim. Here's just a close-up of one of them. It took it took days and days of of getting this these time-lapse photos. And this is a so that one's 20 minutes. This is about 45 minutes. Um, but you can understand trying to quantify this without time-lapse is was impossible. I was on, I was gonna shoot myself. So I came up with this uh, method to quantify it and collect more data. And we started figuring out stuff just about the pathogen development that we never knew before, these time scales. So we're talking uh, 45 minutes, we need to, uh, be, when it becomes flooded, say say you're in a greenhouse, so thinking practically, you're in a greenhouse, you flood your plants or you water them, and maybe you water too much, you have 45 minutes, you can have an explosion like this, okay? And they're swimming around trying to find your plant. All right, so when I have um, compost in here, uh, and I was making a, just a quick uh, water version of it, four hours soaking it in water, uh, so you can't see through solid material. Um, you can see there's no, well, there's very little vesicle production. I think this one, one here, produces a vesicle, but it eventually lyses. Okay, just like that one's lysing. But you have these germ tubes, all right? 
So these germ tubes are producing here, and really no, there's only been like one or two mentions in the literature about germ tubes. And we have no idea whether or not they can cause infection. All right, so um, this is just a close-up of lysing, of that uh, little cartoon of it, uh, you, you left to right, top to bottom, and you can see it lysing over time. And we started asking questions about that, what's doing that? And um, we know that there's a bacterium, uh, Pseudomonas fluorescence, that produces cyclic lipopeptides. You can isolate those and produce them, and we put that in the same um, system, and we saw the same kind of lysing occur. So it's possible that that was going on, but we didn't examine it. And, and we do know that the, the pseudomonads are commonly found in uh, suppressive soils and compost materials. All right. So now I'm going with um, using all that information, all right, I worked my way through and said, all right, well, the site of infection is the seed. And we know that microbes are responsible for suppression. Um, what happens if we take those microbes from um, suppressive compost and we apply them directly to the seed coat? All right. And the working hypothesis being solid compost can suppress pythium and phanerometum, and it's uh, mediated by microorganisms and microbial byproducts, those uh, cyclic lipopeptides. All right. Uh, we know non airy compost extracts exhibit similar levels of disease suppression. So we could take the solid material, it's suppressive. We take the liquid material, it's similarly suppressive. And we know it's microbially mediated. You need to sterilize the material. Heat sterilize it or filter sterilize. Both. So can we freeze dry that liquid extract and get it into a powder form now? Okay, so. Uh, What's left is um, a microbial component and some organic matter, a very small amount of organic matter in that freeze-dried material. And we have done, we re reconstituted it, um, and disease suppression still occurred. Okay, so you could add water back to it, make the same material, and still have suppression. All right? All right, so I'm asking the question, can freeze-dried extracts into a powder be coated onto a seed uh, to suppress soil-borne plant pathogens using standard seed coating procedures? All right, so we have, this is um, kind of the general procedures. Make your compost, um, and then you have your solid compost material. You put it through, this is a little brewer here. We're making non-aerated compost extracts, and freeze drying it after after a um, defined period of time of making it take it and freeze dry it and what's left is this powder here okay and you get a very small amount and that's about 0.2 grams uh, in weight from 300 milliliters of liquid material so it's a very small return but again you could dust that over many seeds alright and where we are now is this part <laughs> so at each stage, what we, what we need to do is determine um, microbial, and this is all proof of concept. And people have taken the liquid extracts and teas and soaked seeds in them, and there's been mixed results. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it can make your seeds rot, okay? Um, and nobody wants to take their expensive seeds, as if you, anybody heard some of the other, one of the other um, seed talks, um, take that and risk losing 10 percent of them. Uh, so we want to challenge or we want to determine microbial vi viability at each stage and just to make sure that we're not losing anything especially from downstream from here. So um, what happens here to there um, to this and you could determine that plate counts is probably the direction we're going to go. Um, and so we're going to coat cucumber seeds with, the, uh, with a standard binder, Omni-approved binder, that uh, you could then, you could, you could blow the dried extract onto the coated seed and then uh, encrust that to the seed. It says microbial viability at each stage. 
and then conduct disease bioassays. And again, this is all um, proof of concept that if it works, it, we're providing just another tool in the disease management toolbox. If it doesn't, I guess nobody's at a loss except my hours of research. But it, th th there's, there's no magic bullet to any, uh, when it comes to disease management, uh, particularly soil-borne disease management. And we're just trying to offer another tool. Whether or not it's economical, that would be determined downstream. And these are the supporters of the project. Most of this work is in collaboration with Cornell University and Rodale. That's it.